Glory. If we haven't met, my name is Mike, and uh, I have the honor to share God's word today. And if we haven't met, come down here after service. I'd love to meet you, say hi, uh, shake your hand, answer any cries of outrage that you may have from the message, uh, whatever the case may be. But we're continuing in the rise and build, as Pastor Adam talked about. And I got the honor to talk about discipleship and discipleship making and what that looks like. And, and I'm so excited because I've had this download for about a month now that God's just been showing me and showing me. So hopefully... I can get you out of here in like an hour or so, but uh, there's a lot of information to go through. So you guys ready to get going? Yeah. All right, let's start off with God's word here. Matthew, 20, Matthew 28. What's that? I said you are joking. I am joking. It'll be shorter than, well, maybe. You might just have to roll me out of here. All right, so in Matthew 28, verse 18, and Jesus came up, spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Father God, I give you all the glory. I give you all the praise because you're truly worthy of it all, Father God. We cannot do anything without you. We do not want to do anything without you, Father. As I always pray, remove me from the stage. Get me out of here. Shut my mouth what is not of yours and let you speak, Father God. Open our ears to hear. Open our hearts to hear. Open our eyes to hear what it is that you have for us about discipleship, Father. We give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen. Like I always tell you, if I'm up here sharing about what God's downloaded to me, he's either already done a work in me on it or he's continuing to do a work in this area as well. And I pray that he does a work in each and every one of us. You see, he commanded us, he taught us here that we need to go and make disciples of all nations. But what does it look like? What does discipleship mean? What does a disciple look like? Well, a disciple trusts Jesus completely. I mean, 100% trust him and gives him everything of their life, everything. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you're doing is praising him for breath in your lungs. You're asking him, where is it that you want me to go today? What do you want me to do today? What is it that I'm going to eat today? What are you providing for me? They trust him in every aspect of their life. They imitate Jesus completely not only as teacher, but as Lord. And that word Lord is not a name for him, but it's that title. It's the Lordship that we give him. You see, when we call him Lord, we're servant at that point. Right? When we call him Lord, we are servants. That's why he says, some will call me Lord, Lord, and will not enter the kingdom because they're using it as merely just a name and not the Lordship. They look to Jesus' teaching as the basis for moral decision making. You got to get into the word. They love Jesus so much that that love spills out to every relationship they have, even with people in traffic. <laughs> it spills out into every area of their life. And they form their life around Jesus and Jesus alone. They're not chasing after worldly things. They're only chasing after the kingdom and that's it. But how do we do this? How do we get to that point? How do we start to look like that? How can we start making disciples, right? I mean, he tells us, right in Matthew 28, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I have commanded you. That's the type of person we're called to make. That's what we're called to do. But we're not doing it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus does the changing and transforming. He tells us right there at the end, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That's the freedom you have. That's the freedom to go out and share your faith. That's the freedom to go out and disciple. That's the freedom to go out and teach because he's doing the changing and transforming. And he's with you to the end of the age. But who did Jesus decide to disciple? How did he pick who he was discipling? What did he do, right? Well, just look at Jesus and his life and and what it looks like. You see, Jesus did nothing, I mean absolutely nothing, before being baptized and having an encounter with the Holy Spirit. I mean, you can look in Luke 4, right? 
In Luke 4, this is right after Jesus was baptized. It says, now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness, and for 40 days being tempted by the devil, he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he was hungry. I mean, that's a funny statement right there. I'd be hangry. I'd be really, really upset because it's 40 days without food, right? I mean, but think about it. That's when the devil came in and tried to destroy the plan. That's when the enemy came in and tried to destroy everything, misquoting scripture out of context, taking it all when Jesus is down there 40 days after not eating, right? But this is the, this is the thing. It says he was tempted, but Jesus did not sin. And that's freeing for some of you in here. The temptation is not the sin, right? The sin comes with what you're going to do after that temptation. Where's your mind go? Do you take every thought captive? And what did Jesus do? He quoted scripture three times in context and defeated the enemy. And then it says in verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit and news about him spread through all the surrounding region. He began teaching in the synagogues and was praised by all. So if Jesus Christ, the son of man, did nothing without the Holy Spirit, why do we try to do it ourselves? He did nothing, no ministry, no nothing, no miracles without the Holy Spirit. You see, when you're discipling, when you're leading somebody, right, when you're trying to find who it is that you're discipling, you better be following the Holy Spirit. You better be listening to what the Holy Spirit's telling you. You better be in tune with the Father and what he's telling you. If you're not, it's okay. You need to humble yourselves and come under somebody's teaching. You need to be the one that's getting discipled. Peter was not always Peter who preached to the masses and 3,000 came to know Jesus. Peter's also the same guy that denied him three times. But Peter's also the one that had the boldness to step out of the boat and walk on the water. But he's also the one that took his eyes off from Jesus and started to sink. Right? The disciples weren't always these disciples that we think. They had to humble themselves. Come under teaching for a season and learn and listen and follow after Jesus. You see, each and every one of us is called to make disciples. But not everyone in here right now is at the place to disciple somebody. You may be at a place where you need to humble yourself and come under the teaching of somebody that's imitating Christ. Not themselves, right? Pointing you to Christ and Christ alone. Amen? All right, so how, how in the world did Jesus pick this, the first ones, right? How did he go and pick them? He related to them. He met them where they were at. Look at this in Matthew 4, 19. Matthew 4, 19 says this. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of people is what mine says. You might remember it as fishers of men. It depends on which version you're reading. But that word men there it was humanity, right? He didn't come just to make men, right? It's people, right? He came to make fishers of men, fishers of people, right? He met them where they were at, related to what they did in the natural, right? And turned it and flipped it and showed them what they're going to be doing for the kingdom, that's what he did there. He related to them. In this verse, you see three basic elements of a disciple. It says, follow me, right? Follow Jesus. And then you're going to be changed by Jesus. He says, and I will make you. Jesus does the changing. We do not do any of the changing. It's by him and him alone. And then he says, join in the mission, right? He says, I'll make you fishers of people, fishers of men. So you have to be led by the Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit leading you to? Someone that needs to disciple you, someone that you need to disciple, follow that. But there's some practical things to think about as well when you're going through this. First and foremost, family members. That should be your first stop. If you're not discipling your family, men, if you're not discipling your wife, your kids, start there. And ask them. Ask them, am, am, I, am I doing a good job discipling you? And listen to them. They'll tell you. Right? They'll tell you. And take it and be like, okay, let's change that. It's okay. Humble yourself and start to lead. Right? Lead. Their spiritual state you need to look at. It's pretty hard to disciple somebody that's spiritually dead. Now, I would tell you, you can move them one step closer to somebody that's going to be this person of peace, this person that's a 
ready to receive the gospel, but you can't be spending all your time on somebody that's just spiritually dead that does not want to receive what it is that you have. Gender, it's basic. Men, disciple men. Women, disciple women. Right? Don't be riding around in a car with just you and somebody else. Opposite sex. These things, right? Disciple men with men. Women with women. Family with family. Right? Husband and wives with husband and wives. That should be self-explanatory. Age. We think of this as someone older discipling someone younger, right? Which happened in my life with Pastor Jim. Pastor Jim was my Paul for the longest time. Still is my Paul, right? Where I would learn from him. And it was through life. Doing life together. Riding motorcycles. uh, Playing softball. um, Arguing on the softball field, right? Just watching him. I I see Coach laughing. Just watching him as he imitated Christ. And I was like, I want that in my life. He is imitating Christ and I want to follow that. I want to learn from that. I want to dig into the word. How do you know so much? And just doing life together. But it doesn't always have to be that way. It's more of a spiritual maturity, right? Those that are more spiritually mature, disciple on somebody that's less. So you could have somebody younger that's very spiritual mature that's sowing into your life and you're a much older person, Right? Or it could be just that they're, they're just younger, but they've got a revelation of something and they're sharing it with you, have the humility to accept it, right? There is no junior Holy Spirit. Pastor Adam just shared an, an awesome story about Ruth, right? Like that's the thing, right? That Ruth was like, nah, dad, you got more things to chase after, right? You got more things to go after. Pastor Jim told me just this week, which I don't believe it, but um, he's like, Mike, I learned more from you now than I've ever taught you. That's the humility, right, to be able to be that way. And that's where we got to get to. If we stop learning, if we stop growing, we're dying. We need to be learning each and every day. Amen? All right, so right now you probably got somebody in your mind that you're thinking of, hey, I want to disciple this person or I want to go to this person and I, I want to ask them, right? But what do I need to teach them? What do I need to show them? What is it that... Jesus did, right? You can read all these different types of books that have all these different models and all, and I'm not telling you that they're bad. They're good. They're going to start your brain going, just follow Jesus. Just do what Jesus did, right? So what did Jesus do? What did he impart? How did he do it? He imparted a compassion for the lost, a compassion for the lost. He imparted this servanthood aspect, right? He demonstrated this relationship that was so important to have with the Father. He even taught them how to pray. And how did he do it? He did it by teaching to the masses, right? He would teach to the masses. He also did it by illustrations of the kingdom of God. He even demonstrated it at the feet of the disciples. And even Judas was there, right? He even demonstrated it at the feet of of the disciples. You see, he did this by, I'm gonna do it, you're gonna watch. There's this caught, not taught mentality, right? It's something that you catch. Like when I was with Pastor Jim, it's just something that I caught, not so much that was taught with me, right? Then he did it with a I do, you help me mindset. Then it was, hey, you do this, and I'm gonna help you where you get struggled at. And I'm gonna show you an example of that here in a second. And then he did, you do, and I'm just going to watch you do it. I'm going to leave because my time has come. It's time for you to take over and continue the process. Now, in each and every one of those areas that I talked about, there's instruction that has to be had. There's instruction during that time frame, right? It gets less and less as it goes, but there's still instruction. So Jesus called them, told them to follow him. They watched him do miracles. They watched him do all this stuff, cast out demons, They watched him spend time with the father praying and then Jesus sits him down and he sits him down at the Sermon on the Mount and he goes over some stuff and it starts in chapter five, but we're going to pick up in chapter six where there's some three key principles that he talks about. So in six, one, he says this, take care not to practice your righteousness in the sight of people to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your father who is in heaven. It's exactly what Pastor Adam was talking about. I had no idea he was going to share any of that. It's exactly what he's talking about. There's rewards to be had in the kingdom. We're not chasing after 
earthly rewards. Where's your heart at? Why are you doing what it is that you're doing? Are you doing it to get recognized? Or are you doing it just because you want to be cheerful? You just want to give. You just want to worship the Lord. What's the purpose behind what you're doing? So the first thing he talks about is giving and giving to the poor and not being like the hypocrites. And he says in verse 3, but when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Verse 4, so that your charitable giving will be in secret and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And this is what Pastor Adam was talking about last week when he's talking about the secret place, right? That secret place that you got to get to, that secret place in your heart. Why are you giving? What are you doing it? Those are the rewards that you're chasing after. That's where your treasures are going to be at. The next one he talks about is praying. And once again, he talks about don't being like the hypocrites. But then in verse 6, he says, but as for you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Once again, it's that secret place that you're going to. And he will reward you with heavenly rewards. And then this is the part where he goes in and he teaches them how to pray. I got a cool little drawer here. We have these personal encounter guides. And that's exactly what this is. I encourage you, if you don't have one of these, pick one up from Next Steps. But it tells you how to worship, how to pray, what you should be doing in the mornings, going through the Lord's Prayer, going through your personal prayer, reading the Word. This is what you should be doing on a daily. Wake up in the morning, this is what you're going to be doing. And he's teaching them how to pray right here. <clears throat> and then he goes on. And the next thing he talks about is fasting. Once again, don't be like the hypocrites, he says. Verse 17, but as for you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by the people, but by your father who is in secret. And your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So once again, it's the secret place. What are you doing in the secret place? Those are the rewards that you're chasing after. And I'm not making this up. Look at this, verse 20, right after he talks about fasting. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. That's where we're storing up treasure. These are the basics that we have to teach. How to give, how to pray, how to fast. We want to get into all this theology and the book of Revelation and end times and what's happening, but we can't even get the basics down of when to give, when to pray, when to fast. And then he goes on in verse 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or will be devoted to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So he does all this by an invite and challenge. He invites them to pray, to fast, to give, and then challenges them when they don't. It's kind of like, I'm the spiritual growth pastor here, right? So I might, I'm to invite you to get into small groups, right? And if you're not into a small group, find out who's not into a small group and get you into a small group so you can get into community, right? I'm supposed to invite you into a serve team, get you into a serve team. If you're not in a serve team, find out why you're not in a serve team. Get you into a serve team because we're called to serve, right? If you're not fasting, if you're not praying, but hold up, don't talk to me about money. It's true. I know it hurts, right? Don't talk to me about the money. Don't talk to me about my finances. Isn't that the greatest thing? Like, isn't that what the, the enemy would do? Because right here it says you cannot serve God and wealth. So would the enemy not come in and say, no, no, no. You guys aren't talking about wealth. That's truly what we should be talking about as we're discipling each other, right? As we're discipling, and I'm not even talking about tithe. We're not going to talk about tithe. We're not talking about 10%. We're not debating that. I'm not even talking about giving a journey. I'm not talking about a building fund. I'm just talking about your finances. Where are they going? What are you spending money on? What are you inviting into your home? That's what we should be talking about as we disciple. Amen? All right. I got off topic. Sorry. All right. So now in Mark 9, let's go to Mark 9. This is where we're going to see Jesus, where this is a more of them doing, and he's going to come in and help. This is right after the transfiguration. This is right after he took 
Peter, James, and John up on the mountain. He comes back down. The other disciples are there. There's this dad that brings this, his deaf mute son to the disciples. And now Jesus comes into the picture now. Jesus is back with the other disciples. And the dad's talking to Jesus and says this. And I told your disciples so that they would cast it out, but they could not do it. I love what Jesus says. Oh, you unbelieving generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. And this gets good here, right? So they bring him to Jesus. And when the spirit gets in front of Jesus, it starts to throw the boy into this convulsion, starts acting a fool and making a scene. And Jesus does not freak out, doesn't do anything. This is what Jesus says. I can just picture him looking at the dad and going, so how long has this been happening? Because that's what he says. He says, how long has this been happening to him? Doesn't freak out, doesn't do anything. He's getting into the guy's life. He's asking the questions to him, right? He's relating to this guy about what's going on. And the guy's like, since childhood. And he's like, if... If you can, if you can, have pity on us. <laughs> Jesus says, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. That's where we get that famous line with this guy that says, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. But words matter in the Bible. Every word is there for a reason. The very next verse in verse 25, it says, when Jesus saw the crowd was rapidly approaching, what did Jesus do? He saw this crowd and he's like, uh-uh, enemy. Satan, you're not getting any kind of spectacle. You're not getting any kind of it. It's me. He says this. He says, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him. Do not enter him. As soon as that crowd came around, as soon as there was going to be a spectacle that the enemy was going to get, Jesus is like, uh-uh, that ain't happening here. You have the authority to do the same thing. You have the same authority to do the same thing. The enemy's not getting any kind of spectacle. No, get out of here, be gone. So then they go away and the disciples, at this point, they're like, why is it that we could not cast this thing out? And Jesus says, this kind cannot come out by anything except prayer. Some of you remember it as prayer and fasting. That word is this intense word for prayer, right? Prayer and fasting. But wait. He just taught them how to pray, how to fast, how to give. Why were they not doing it? Matthew 9. I love the Bible. It gives us the answers. Matthew 9, verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus said to them, the attendants of the groom cannot mourn as long as the groom is with them. Can they? But the days will come when the groom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Jesus was with them, right? Jesus was with them at this time. Well, technically, he was gone. They should have been praying and fasting, right? He was up on the hill. Up on the hill. But that's the reason why, right? But here's the best part of this entire story. When Jesus encountered this, he didn't have to run away to the mountain and pray. He didn't have to go soak with the Father for three days. He didn't go have to fast for three days. He didn't have to get himself away and get ready, right? He just said, be gone. Because he lived a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. It's what we're called to do. If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. If you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. And that's exactly what he did. So you see, he does this by a I do, you watch, caught, not taught. I do, you help. You do, I'm going to help you, which is what you just saw here, right? And then you do, I watch. And it was through these three basic principles that you saw it. The first thing, like I talked about, this relationship building that he did. He was doing that with the Father as well, right? This number one thing that Jesus did was get involved in people's lives. When you disciple someone, you're not taking on a project. You are investing in someone's life. Right? It's not a project. No matter how spiritually gifted you think you are, how much theology that you have, right? People won't care what you know until they know that you care. So we need to learn to ask questions just like Jesus was asking questions. We need to learn to listen just as much as we need to learn to ask questions. We need to learn to listen, learn to pay attention, learn to pay attention to what's going on, to the Holy Spirit. 
Don't just come into a meeting or time with someone that you're discipling and have this agenda and want to get through this agenda and miss whatever they're trying to tell you. They could have just had a really bad day. The Holy Spirit could be speaking, trying to get something else out of it from your agenda and you're just messing it up because you're not listening. Sometimes we got to do what Job did to the people, his friends, that were trying to give him advice, right? And they were giving him some horrible advice and Job looked at them, and I love the CSB version that my daughter showed me. It says, if only you would shut up and let that be your wisdom. <laughs> I'm not telling you to tell other people that. I'm telling you to tell yourself that sometimes. Sometimes I need to tell myself I need to shut up. And they'll use that on you too, right? We need to shut up, let that be our wisdom sometimes, and just listen. What's the Holy Spirit saying? Where do we need to go with this conversation? He will guide and direct if we give him the time. James, right? Be slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to hear. Amen. We need to spend relational time together. Not just, all right, let's dig through this aspect, right? Sometimes it's just, hey, come to the store with me. You want to come with, hang out? You want to come over and have some spaghetti? You want to come over and cook some steaks, watch a Super Bowl? Whatever it is that you guys want to do and hang out. Go play some golf, whatever it is. Just have some relational time together, spending together, doing life together. Encourage, speak life. Speak life, speak life, speak life. Amen. Demonstrate vulnerability. Just like I told you, right? He's still working on me just as much as he's working on each and every one of you. You need to demonstrate vulnerability. Don't act like you got everything together because you don't. And if you do have everything together, you just proved you don't have everything together. Be real and honest about what's going on because when you love them and they know it, they'll respond. They'll open up to you. The next thing he did was teach the word of God. Look at this quote I found by Brad Himes. It says, Christians used to be known as people of one book. Sure, they read, studied, and shared other books, but the book they cared about more than any other combined was the Bible. They memorized it, meditated on it, talked about it, taught it to others. We don't do that anymore. In a very real sense, we're starving ourselves to death. God's word produces life transformation. God's word builds conviction for a lifetime. And God's word is truth, right? John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. That's Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm the truth. I'm the only way, right? His word is truth. Let me give you an example. This isn't just about memorizing scripture and just getting it inside of your head. Let me give you an example of this. If I told Ethan, which is my youngest son, this 11, he's 11. If I said, Ethan, go wash the dishes. And then an hour later, he comes back to me and he goes, Dad, I memorized what you said. You said, Ethan, go wash the dishes. What good is that? Or he comes and he's like, hey, Dad, I memorized what you said. And now I'm going to get a bunch of the guys together and we're going to do a word study. And we're going to study what it would look like if I washed those dishes. And we might even learn it in Latin and Greek and break it all down. That's what we do with the word of God. Right? We memorize it, we break it down, we do these word studies, but we don't apply it to our life. The dishes never get done. Right? We never apply that to our life. That's what we're talking about. Let the word transform you, change you, apply it to your life. Doing ministry together is the next one, the third one. Jesus took his disciples, they went all over ministering together. They did life together. He spoke to the masses, he healed, casted out demons, taught for two and a half years. Jesus went about ministering and he took the disciples with him. We need to be doing ministry together. We're not called to do it alone. Amen? So it's caught, not taught. Healthy discipleship involves all three components. Building relationships, studying the word of God, doing ministry together. Each and every one of those. And we can see it with Jesus and the disciples. And we can see it with Paul. What Paul did with Timothy. What Paul did with Titus. And I'm going to read a lot of scripture here coming up with Titus. And we're going to go through what Paul wrote to Titus. You see, Paul built a relationship with him. Taught the word. Did ministry with him. Invited him on the mission. And he challenged him. And then left him to lead. But he gave him this letter, and this letter just talks about discipleship. And if you're ever wondering what we should be teaching, what we should be learning, 
what we should sow into somebody, just read Titus 2 and 3. Here we go. But as for you, proclaim the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are being temperate, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious, gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible in all things, showing yourself to be example of good deeds with purity and doctrine dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. Our slaves be subject to their own masters and everything. We are all bond servants. We are all slaves to one master, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Everything to be pleasing, not argumentative, not stealing, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn to the doctrine of God, our Savior in every respect. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny ungodliness, worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. These things speak and exhort and rebuke all authority. No one is to disregard you. Let's go to three. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. To slander no one, not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This statement is trustworthy. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. So that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good, beneficial for people. This next one hurt. But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law. For they are useless and worthless. I like to debate. Reject a divisive person after a first and second warning. Ouch. Knowing that such a person has deviated from what is right and is sinning, being self-condemned. And then in verse 14, it says, our people must also learn to engage in good deeds to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unproductive. There is so much in there that we can be teaching each and every one of us. We will arise and build, right? Not just the building, but arise and build as in discipleship, right? You got to remember, discipleship is the long game. This isn't something that's just going to change overnight and now everybody's just discipled. Jesus walked with them for two and a half years, sowing into them, pouring into them. That's what we're called to do. Amen? So as we close, would you rise to your feet? In this letter that Paul wrote to Titus. It's a short one, it's three chapters. But there's so much in here and so many important lessons about discipleship. I'm gonna give you three here. A disciple maker leads people to maturity. We have got to lead them to maturity. A disciple maker enables the disciple to follow Christ. You see, Paul gave Titus advice about leading. But in his letter, he repeatedly pointed Titus to remember his identity as someone that has been saved by Jesus Christ. And that his identity is found in Jesus. It's not about the disciples' personality, right? Discipleship is about learning to become more and more like Christ. So as we disciple somebody, as we're being discipled, we better be starting to look more and more like Christ and pointing them to Christ. And lastly, a disciple maker allows the disciple to lead. And that's what Jesus did. He raised them up. That's what Paul did too. 
He raised up Timothy and Titus and let them go and lead when they were ready. Eventually, disciples must step out of the mentor's shadow. I can remember doing journey Bible class, starting it off real early, and being okay teaching. As long as, long as Pastor Jim was in that room, I was good. But I needed to lead on my own, and it came a time where there was a, a spot that he left, and he had to have the confidence that I was going to be able to do it on my own. And a debate came up in there. And I was able to handle it by the power of the Holy Spirit and the teaching that was put into me from him beforehand. We have to be able to let them lead and move on. So as the uh, usher team come on forward, I wanna close this way. If you need any prayer at all for anything, I want you to come to the front and meet with them up here. If you're trying to figure out, am I ready to disciple? If I'm not ready to disciple, I want you to come up and get boldness. If you're, if you're like, I need boldness to be able to approach the person that it is that I want to talk to, just step out in boldness and talk to them.